Ah. Well, I think what he's trying to put the, the videos while the debate. So the floor is open for questions uh, for our three, three speakers. Who wants to, to begin? I believe it, it didn't work because it would have seen expanded. Because in duplicated window, okay. it works. So uh, let me share so Gregorio can see also. And you can, well, people is asking questions to each of you. You can show us also. Take a place, all of you. Yeah, you can take a seat, I think it's. Uh, otherwise, I have a few questions of my own. Uh, well, it is for uh, Christoph. Uh, I think uh, Tarsus, Christoph, and myself could be here for hours and days discussing <laughs> what you said. <laughs> but. Uh, I may focus on uh, an important uh, thing. Uh, I think it's important for uh, uh, all the people here. Um, you presented some uh, very nice uh, features, uh, advanced features, uh, well, some amazing things uh, on a space syntax application. Uh, but uh, what I, uh, your goal, in your first goal, you said it was to spread the, the space syntax and the associated techniques to the general architectural practitioner. And uh, so you develop this in Udini, or Udini is something that is, uh, well, Less architects know Dini than the space syntax. <laughs> so why Udini? <laughs> uh, I'm working on a similar goal, but we are trying to put it in uh, Revit and Archicad and Rhino. <laughs> Something that the architect already uses and can, uh, well, it can be more, more familiar. And the, the other things, you refined some uh, aspects with a, a very fine, uh, very fine solutions. And uh, but is this the way to get to the to the general practitioner? Uh, perhaps not the refinement is important, but uh, I would say two things uh, in the interface between the technique and the, the architect, in the inputs and the, in the outputs. In the inputs, uh, you have to uh, create a new geometry, not the geometry that exists naturally in the, in the architect project you don't solve this problem. What would be best, uh, the architect does the project and automatically the space syntax uh, technique program is going to pick what he wants from the, that thing and the architect has to do nothing else. And then in the output, well, your outputs uh, seem to be as, um, uh, black box uh, to the architect. It does not. It does not, he know nothing about uh, the apps and uh, uh, integration. He wants something that he understands, <laughs> uh, and uh, you you don't offer them the, those right things that the things you want. He, he wants uh, well. So I uh, like the, very much your, uh, um, I would like to discuss, not here, but uh, at lunch some, somewhere, uh, many of the solutions you, you uh, provided. Uh, but this is uh, the question. Your, um, your pass your, uh, is the right pass to, to get to the, to the, the, the architect, to the, the concrete architect, the practitioner architect. 
I stay here. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, well, um, l l let me, I will try to, to break it down to a couple of points. Um, the first thing is that originally I started to work on, on WISAP um, purely, purely because of using it as a tool in the, in the early design phase of, uh, of doing designs. And I have to say, I've, I've, I've been studied at the university in Vienna by Saadit, so I'm doing rather, let's say, formalistic kind of architecture. That's what I do personally. So, um, um, why I choose finally Houdini was because of two reasons. Uh, one reason because it's highly optimized for working with very, very large data sets. So I didn't have to invent this by myself. I could just use what, pro, uh, what uh, Houdini provides. And the other one is that it's very, very flexible in terms of, of uh, integrating different uh, tools, like you have Python, you, you can code everything in C++, you can use WEX, which is a very optimized internal language for Houdini. You can use uh, OpenCL, you have a, a lot of different and very, very fast uh, scripting languages to do a couple of things very easily. So you, you don't have to invent the wheel. You can just use what Houdini provides. So that, that was a, a key argument. And the other one is um, that it's, it's, uh, it has a very, very sophisticated and procedural geometry core. So you don't have to model everything new. You can just import it. You have to have, you need to have meshes, not solids, or not NURBS, something like that. You have to have meshes, which you need anyways, because everything, or whenever you do ray tracing or ray casting, you have to translate it into a mesh anyway. You have to, everything to translate into a triangle. So Houdini is very optimized in doing this. Um, and that was the other thing that uh, because it's it's highly procedural and you can you can do design variations very efficiently um, that was the other very important thing for me why I choose Houdini as a platform to to uh, develop this up upon so i wouldn't i wouldn't I, I understand that for most architects um, Houdini may not be the right platform. But um, I think as soon as you know what it can do, there's, for me at least, there's no question between using Revit for this kind of work. Don't get me wrong. Just this kind of work, not, not uh, uh, construction work, something like this. For, for this work, Houdini is completely useless. But for, for this early design, in, in this early design stage, Houdini is, at least for me, a very, very good tool and a very, very good um, platform or develop environment in which you can do things very easy and very fast. Uh, you, you covered uh, half of my, my question. I think uh, I agree with you with the use of Houdini. So my question was about optimization. I missed the good part of your presentation, so I, don't, I can't comment on the, on the new things that you did. I would like to talk to you about this. Please explain a bit more privately. Um, so at some, in the end, though, you said, like, I want to jump uh, from C++ to Houdini scripting. To be honest, I had no idea that Houdini can, can do all, you know, you can do plugins in C, in Python, or whatever, you know. It's highly optimized probably, yes, because of the, the functions that other people use. I'm not a Houdini guy, I don't need, yeah. Um, so, 
I am going opposite direction. I think you need even more optimization at some point. This is my problem as well. I mean, within depth map, you can't really do uh, fancy stuff now. All my code is pure C++, multi-threaded to, to the death, like um, mutexes and uh, semaphores like to the death to just to find the maximum way of calculating like uh, the most amount of millions of raycasts. If you want to do a 3D, like a big model like that, I do. So I think, I don't know why you want to go uh, to a more abstract level of coding with a Houdini uh, toolkit. This is what you said in the end, and I was going opposite direction. I think you need something specialized. When you do 3D and when you have like a like complex models that you need to raycast, even with a game engine that you can do A, A, B, B, whatever separations and segmentation of, of your scene. I think Houdini does se segmentation probably internally. And yeah, I think you need more optimized. And I, I think you're, you're in, on a better track than, uh, than myself and others probably, because I didn't know that uh, Houdini can do that. So, but don't, I don't think you need to go in a, in a more abstract language than or toolkit sorry i don't i don't know how houdini defines these things but the fact that you know how to do these things in c plus plus i wouldn't go in something uh um, slower let's say because i from the data sets i use uh, which are now bigger and bigger and bigger there's there's a problem with the dimensionality and the and the size so um I'm feeding you the opposite direction now from, from, I don't know Revit as well. I don't use Revit, so maybe I'm a bit biased, but yeah. Uh, yeah, well, well um, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose another language if, it wouldn't be at least nearly as fast as C++. So, um, because it, it's quite interesting. Um, I use C++ most of the time in the geometry generation process. All the geometry and data manipulation is, is done in WEX. Because it's fully multi-threaded and it's, it's, it's sometimes even faster than C++. So it, it's incredible fast. So it's a SIMD structure, so it's, it's perfectly multi-threaded. It doesn't work for everything, but if you can multi-thread something, it's perfectly fine. So your, your, your raycasting is thread safe, for example? Yeah, it is. It is. It, is. It, builds a, it builds a KD tree or a binary split tree and then it casts that's the ring. Like and that's it. And, and most of it is done on the, on the, on the, on the GPU. But the, the interesting thing is the GPU, it's, I'm using um, NVIDIA's optics library. So therefore, I had to use C++. But um, I think a couple of months ago, NVIDIA um, well, developed a new tool where you can use the library, so the optics library, through Python. So which would make several things much easier because it's, it's more accessible for more people. So that's, that's the point I'm going with. Okay, yeah, no, I think, yeah, I don't know so much, so probably I would like to, <laughs> to know more. And maybe convert my stuff no. <laughs> if it's that magic. It really sounds great, okay. Yeah. More questions? I'd like to, well, yeah. Hello, good morning. My question is to Rui and regarding the use of games in teaching um, mostly urbanism, as you mentioned it. Um, I think it's um, yeah, an, an interesting approach. Um, however, uh, I would like to ask you, how do you, um, among the different games you mentioned it, how do you um, 
establish a link between the rules of the games and the rules of uh, the way the city can be structured in, in a way. And uh, how those more qualitative things that are also implied in the city organization, in city planning, um, are mixed with those quantification process that you told us about when talking, uh, uh, when, when telling, when, when explaining the, the, the relevance of those games uh, for the process, or the learning process regarding uh, how to learn, how to plan a city, or to think about the city, etc. So, um, is this uh, articulation between this um, quantification, these uh, the rules that the old games have, and that is quite clear? But uh, how do you then um, cross it with um, with a qualitative, qual a qualitative um, um, framework that uh, is also implied in the in, in learning how to think about the city? And you mentioned. Uh, Kevin Lynch and most of the things Kevin Lynch told tell us about is uh, is about perception, is about the way we perceive the city and the, and how we understand the city through qualitative approaches, not quantification. So, I would like you to, if possible, to go a little bit uh, to elaborate a little bit more on that uh, relation between uh, both approaches, qualitative and quantitative, based on games. Of all of those games, the one that you think is best suitable for the for the learning process. Well, uh, this uh, it's a difficult question. Of course, the, I don't think that all the games are, are useful. I think the games have an analogy, and that analogy is interesting to observe. Interesting as intellectual. Uh, mind and they, they are interesting because they are ludic and the uh, and the young the young students are used to play with cars for example and they they are used to play with digital games uh, more than our generation of course if we if you say to a student nowadays they are used with the with the mobiles and the, all the technology and they are not with as our generation started to play these kind of things. But they are interesting as an analogy. The, 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 the application they are trying to, to explain um, is useful as a first part of the exercises, only to uh, make them comprehend uh, a few different things. They are, they are not always common because they are, more, they are more focused on the physical aspects of the city and some measures of the building. So the discipline and the scale of urbanism is different from architecture. So this kind of approach, I think, make them open a little bit their minds. This game, this application is not, as you know, tested already. But I think it's a, it's a, in the first far, it's the first part of the exercises that can be useful. And, and as, a, as a trying to answer to the qualitative, uh, um, the, to the qualitative um, relevance of the, of the thing, of the planning, of the design, of course, this kind of games, I don't reach yet how this can be useful in that kind of, uh, of problem. But uh, I think further on, we can, we can improve and maybe there are always there are also some other applications, although I was not trying to defend this as a unique model, of course, because they are the traditional and classical ways of teaching and when analyzed in project and design, of course, this can be a complementary uh, additional uh, trying to diverse more or less their fixed ideas of the students and trying to make them understand more the scales of urbanism, the scales of the organization of the whole city, of the com complex, uh, but not as a unique element, more as a, an additional, uh, additional complement that can be useful in one class, two class, three class in all the semester. And then, of course, the studio design can develop uh, itself. But I believe that this can be useful in the few times that I try to test it. Sorry uh, for not answering exactly 
uh, no, no, but, I, but it's a true. I, I just want to <laughs> add. I just want to add something to what you were saying. I, I participate in the workshop that you organize using the the gaming approach, and one of the things that I found it very interesting is that how students with a, a short list of rules, because the, the game has a, a straight. Um, set of package of, of rules that students have to deal with. And that in, yesterday, I don't know who said that sometimes constraints is better for creativity than a, than a white sheet. I don't re remember who said it. Uh, I think Sophia maybe. Yeah, Sophia. And it was interesting to understand within that workshop that um, that constraints about the number of rules that they had to play was also very creative for them because they, they didn't have a, they, they, they couldn't do whatever they want to do in the city. So they have, I don't know, 10, 15 maximum rules. And within the combination of those set of rules, they um, developed this idea of, of a city. That was a very interesting exercise for them. And, and, and most of all, to understand the implication of the relation between rules. If I said a rule A with rule C, the, the effect would be uh, um, one. If, if I said rule B with rule E, the, the effect would be two. So this uh, uh, correlation between rules and the effect and the impact of the correlation between rules, uh, uh, um, a straight set of, of rules was interesting for them to understand how the, the, city, how the thing Things in cities are quite um, correlated, and and they have implications in between. So, I think that was um, a nice experience. And it, in that exercise, the qualitative approach was set not by was the the um, the final configuration of the city, but the, the the decision process. The qualitative approach was embedded in the decision process by establishing the set of rules that were combined or correlated. So it was an um, indirect way to have a qualitative mindset in a quantitative uh, approach. So that's what I would like to highlight in that. OK, I agree. I have another question. Thank you. Um, I would have a, a question for, for Rui, uh, but I would like to start a bit more, more general. Um, I think that the organization of the of the program of this uh, of this conference uh, was very democratic. It, it changed along the way, and um, the times have changed. And when when I was coming to this uh, session, um, uh, I, I was thinking that the, the three presentations, or at least Claudia and Rui on the one hand and Christophe on the other, didn't have nothing to do with, with each other because of this process of putting uh, uh, but but then in the end they they, they do and uh, one of the reasons is because Christopher has said as Franklin has just comment that um, he would like that uh, this tool that is developing in a very sophisticated way would be used by uh, practitioners which is uh, at least in my opinion uh, a very valuable goal. Um, so I think that, in a way, the topic of research and practice brings together the, the three of them. But I, I would like to, to focus on, on uh, Rui's presentation. Um, I, I'm very interested on, on games. And now that we are in the same city teaching, I think we have the opportunity to, to, to talk about it in a, uh, with more detail. But I think that. Um, Besides of games, your, your presentation um, touches very important things that have to do with other things that are not only about games. And um, one of the things that caught my attention was your uh, questioning of continuity. Why do we do it? Um, we could do it another way. Uh, we decided to explore this idea of, of continuity. Um, and then, and this is a huge issue, that could be the topic of a conference, for instance. And then you, you raise an, a, another uh, huge question, which is, what is good? Um, and that could be another conference. Um, but I think that we can start to, to answer these, these questions. I think that the, the discussion of, of good 
must and we are all acting on, a, on, on the physical form of cities, or I think that most of us are, uh, I think that the discussion of good uh, cannot be um, framed only by, by the physical stuff. Of course, we have to think first of the social, ec economic of the, of the people, and our answer for what is good must come fr from that. And after um, defining that, and the answer for that can be political, can be participatory, can be scientific, but only after that, we have to question, uh, should we aim at continuity? Is continuity still a good thing to, to pursue? I'm uh, convinced that it is, but not any co continuity. We have to decide exactly we should, what we should continue to bring from the old city or from somewhere else to, uh, to, to achieve these major goals for, for society. And for instance, we can think of our space syntax colleagues. Um, they do not do axial maps just because. Uh, they do it because uh, they have an idea of a city. They think that uh, a good city is a city with many people on the streets, walking or standing by. And be, because of that, they, they have developed a way to, um, to measure uh, this permanence or this um, walking around. And, uh, and within this, uh, they tend to focus on, on something that uh, tries to, to offer some continuity. They focus on space, they do not focus on buildings, so it's not about continuing to, 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 to bring uh, forms of the past uh, into the present and, on, and, the, and f future, but they try to bring some of the things of the streets of the past into the present and on the future. So I think it's, it's a, a great question uh, to raise, and uh, perhaps you can continue on the coffee break. I'm not waiting for an answer. <laughs> I just wanted to pick up because I think it's something that um, it's not raised many times, and I think it should be. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Vitor. I, I agree with your reflection, of course. Um, the, the years pass, and you are an expert, the years pass, and we trying to make the questions, uh, are we doing well? Are we establishing the rules well? Are we, are we teaching well? Of course, because uh, the doubt, the duvida, uh, is always interesting to debate, and the basic, the basic doubts. Um, I think your, your and Claudia uh, reflection of the gap between practice and research, well, uh, <clears throat> from from 20 years ago, I'm a bridge between research more or less in practice. As you know, I, 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 I work in teams of planning and different scales of planning. I uh, research a little bit. Uh, of course, many of us are the bridges of this research and practice. But um, the, the way that you make the question, of course, I, I, I mostly agree with that because in the planning and the rules, in our specific uh, planning regulation of Portuguese, Spanish, they are more similar. Uh, we try always to, to, to make um, good balances and uh, trying to make continuities in housing, employment, uh, streets. Um, but uh, um, as the things change, as the world change, as the dynamic changes, as the social economic activities change, as the urban uh, regeneration is going to improve each year, of course, these things are came to us and make us doubt that the ways that we try to establish the organization of the city maybe is uh, is is uh, not uh, present anymore. So. The, the doubts, I, I agree with them, and uh, it's a good uh, thing to make um, a, a, a national or regional uh, talk about these things with um, other colleagues, international, of course, can be useful. So, to Claudia and Vitor, 
and for everyone else. We have talked about the dissemination. Uh, yesterday we talked about uh, the importance of school in the dissemination of uh, research and uh, particularly in, in uh, formal methods. Uh, we know how the market puts a new product uh, uh, in, the, in the market. It's uh, through some advantage, for example, new color with yet more sugar. It's a, a, a big improvement. Uh, uh, well, I think in architecture there is not that, uh, we have not demonstrated that research produces better products, maybe if we put more sugar, I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, well, clearly we have CAD, uh, but with a very deficient, very, uh, not very well understood by uh, architects. We have BIM and GIS, but imposed by the exterior, and uh, I, I think uh, not very suited for uh, the architectural practice. And then we have nothing. And uh, all the techniques uh, you have, we have uh, are not, uh, and, uh, and some are uh, very proved and uh, old. Space index, for example, how many years? 40 years, 50 years. <laughs> yes, and the, well, the, the, and they, they are proved. <laughs> yes, they are proved. Uh, uh, and uh, well, the, the office, the architectural office, yet does not want to use it. <clears throat> Uh, you, you, Claudio, refer to many, many projects of uh, dissemination. What you, you think are the, the best of those, well, which uh, of uh, them, uh, which type of them would have the, or have the, the, the better effects, the better results, and what you think, uh, well, uh, are the best ways to do this, uh, this dissemination. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. It's interesting because you are uh, talking about the more effective tools, if I understand, this uh, uh, beam or this kind of tool. But um, we are a step uh, after because we are, we think that um, in teaching, we have to start to focus on the, the structural things because uh, in Portugal, for instance, I don't know how it is here, but in Portugal, in the architectural school, we just talk about buildings and uh, how large the building is, how fashion the building is. And uh, this kind of tools that you are talking about, like uh, BIM and uh, have it and they do uh, uh, amazing things in these kind of uh, tools but we want to bring them their attention to the structural things the city to the streets to the plots to the this kind of, of things and try to to focus a little bit more on that structural things and not only in this in the buildings so I, I cannot answer you what these tools could be the best because I'm not an expert on that. But I want to, we want to, to, to put the focus on these structural things and not only in the in the buildings. I'm not, know, I, I don't know if I answer your question. Listen, what of, of your projects you showed there had more effects? What type of uh, Dissemination as the. Oh, the, the oh sorry. So I don't understand. Um, I, we are just in the process, so we don't have results yet. But um, uh, in the workshops and uh, with this kind of. Uh, we are very different when we, we are with the enterprise staff, with the university staff, and with students. We all think, think very differently. So I, I don't know what of these events are more effective, but in the end, I think that uh, when we talk about it and when you see what, how the other people think, it is nice to, to exchange some ideas, but um, 
I think that it is it. It is just to to put the students in in to see how because the research is not exactly like teaching and so we have the teaching the research and the practice together and then the students go from the the, the one world to another world and they just uh, see how different ways we saw the the things and but I, I, I don't know how it will work better but I think this is the process it is we have very very a huge number of and today they are in the office and the, uh, tomorrow they are in the in the uh, with us with the researchers and they are just moving around and uh, see a lot of things let's see how it goes in the end thank you okay a, sh uh, a short one because i think you can so just to uh, complete claudia's answer um if I understood it well, when you say projects, you were mentioned the, the, the first slides when uh, Claudia has uh, give you, um, we are addressing a very difficult question, which is how to relate research and practice. And we have tried these three group of things. Is that it that you are? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, one of the ways were, was tools, um, and what, what we mean by tools? Uh, something that we decide to create together with a group of practitioners. So it's not a very elaborated thing like space syntax again, sorry. Uh, but it's something that we do on GIS, just bringing our knowledge, uh, uh, identifying a particular problem and um, establishing some simple ways. <laughs> or funny, <laughs> or funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so th this would be one, one type of answer to this very difficult question, at least in my opinion. It's a very different, uh, difficult question to, to, to address. Uh, th another thing that we've tried was to um, invite some colleagues, uh, in, in the format of a book, uh, invite some colleagues we are, who are mostly in the university, but from time to time they, they do practice, so they can explain what is their vision on, of the city, what is their physical vision of the city, and how do they apply these concepts that they teach into their design of a building, or which is built, not a project, uh, or uh, in the design of a policy or a plan. And then the third way, uh, which Claudia devoted more time, is let's um, also focus on, on, on processes. Uh, trying to build a sequence of coordinated events very extended in time, in this case is three years, with a lot of events happening where we can uh, build, we can bring together a um, relatively large number of people that during three years get exposed, the researchers get exposed to practice and the practitioners get exposed to, to, to research. If you say, which one has the better results? I cannot give you a, a, a straightforward answer, but I, I think that the most promising is this one on trying to build processes that are extended over years, because I think that most of the time what happens, as, as Claudia has mentioned in, in her talk, is that we, we, we tend to uh, be fascinated for this question for like one month, we, we, we bring someone, imagine I, I bring David from the local authority to speak in one of my conferences and that's it. Uh, what is the impact? Not much. But if we try to build a process that is thought like a process since the beginning, perhaps from these three different um, ways of addressing this difficult problem is uh, the most promising, uh, I don't know. But I think that uh, these three and many more can be worth exploring because this is a, I think, a key issue for us that, that to research. 
Thank you. Okay, I think we can wrap it up and, or continue even better the conversation over a cup of coffee, a cup of tea in the basement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia, Rui, and, and Christophe. And thank you, everyone in the audience and online for this uh, excellent session. Thank you.